Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Crowdlinker Fireside Chat. I'm Aram Milkumuf, the host. Thanks for tuning in. On the show, I'm interviewing product and innovation leaders from uh, within large uh, industries. Uh, sorry, I'm going to start again. My bad. I had a different... Uh, a different intro for another show. <laughs> I do. <laughs> All right, let me start again. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Crowdlinker Fireside Chat. I'm Aram Makumuf, the host. Thanks for tuning in. On the show, I'm interviewing product innovation leaders who are working on big industry disrupted problems from within the large organizations. My guests have been in the trenches and have lots of practical advice to share around building quality digital products, staying agile, and fostering an innovation mindset. This is season two, uh, episode number eight, and I'm here today with Teresa Torres to chat about continuous discovery, how to shift from building features to running small research activities, uh, and best practices for recruiting participants at scale, and how to correctly gather insights from interviews. Quick background on Teresa. Uh, she's a product discovery coach, blogger, and author. She has helped digital product teams from around the world adopt continuous product discovery practices, including a regular cadence of customer interviews, rapid prototyping, and assumption testing. Some of her recent clients include Allstate, CarMax, Capital One, Snag a Job, and Spotify. Super excited to have you on our show today, Teresa. Thanks so much for participating. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. So let me just uh, ask the first question is, um, well, for me really to prepare for this interview, uh, I was watching a lot of your, your content that you have and something that you mentioned really kind of um, stuck out to me. And you said that most of what we build these days in product is not the right stuff. So I thought we could, uh, we could start there and unpack that uh, at the beginning. So why do you, why do you feel this way? Yeah, so this isn't new. Thankfully, it's starting to get better. Um, but I think what we've seen is that uh, with internet, um, with digital products, particularly internet products, we actually have really great tools for measuring impact. So we can look at behavioral analytics. We can um, track people as they use our products and services. And as a result, what we're learning is that we're building a lot of stuff that people simply don't use. Um, and even the best product teams are building a lot of stuff that people simply don't use. And I think that's why we're seeing a huge growth in popularity of discovery, um, not just as a topic, but the adoption of um, practices and activities to, to help us make better decisions about what to build. Awesome. And I know that a lot of the work that you've done with a lot of your clients in the product realm has, has resonated quite successfully. Uh, especially about the part about continuous discovery. Uh, can you tell us a bit about what is continuous discovery and why you think it's gained so much traction recently? Yeah, so discovery is simple. It's just all the work that we're doing to make decisions about what to build, right? So we're, we're distinguishing it from the work we're doing um, to ship, to, to build, maintain, and ship a, a production quality product, which we typically refer to as delivery. Um, so on the discovery side, we're looking at how are we making decisions about what to build. If we're building a lot of the wrong stuff, that's usually the, the decisions about what to build are a good place to kind of look to correct that. Um, as we've seen discovery methods mature, we've seen a lot of adoption of what I would call project-based discovery, where we're, we're turning our research into a big project. We're interviewing a bunch of customers all at once. We're summarizing it into a research report. Maybe we're doing some late stage usability testing before we hand it off to engineers. Um, there's nothing wrong with project-based discovery. That's the first thing I'll highlight. It's definitely better than no um, customer-focused discovery. Um, but we're seeing that uh, if we really want to adopt this sort of agile, continuous improvement, um, continuous delivery cadence, it really needs to be supported by a continuous discovery cadence where we're getting um, feedback from our customers on our daily and weekly sort of questions that arise as we develop products. So really, I think continuous discovery is becoming more of a thing because is because continuous delivery is becoming more of a thing. And ultimately, we're just trying to get value into our customers' hands quicker. So you're talking about, um, you mentioned delivery. So for the audience who's going to be listening, can you, ex can you explain the difference between discovery and delivery? Yeah, so discovery is just the work that we do to make decisions about what to build. So what products should we build? What features should we add? Um, delivery is the work we're doing on the engineering side to um, write code, 
uh, ship a production quality product, maintain it over time. Um, so it's really those sort of system architecture decisions, all your code writing, your release planning, all that kind of stuff lives on the delivery side. And the reason why this distinction has uh, like arisen and become popular is that companies know to stress about delivery and to really like um, hammer on, we got to deliver, we got to hit the schedule. Um, and we're starting to realize we also need to stress as much about how we're making discovery decisions. Mm -hmm. And what would you say um, are some general do's and don'ts about continuous discovery? Yeah, the big one is um, to really try to shift from a from a project mindset to a um, a continuous mindset. And this is really hard because so much of business operates on a project cadence. And mm -hmm. for a lot of us, if we haven't seen what a continuous cadence looks like, it's a little bit hard to wrap your brain around it, right? So um, I talk about continuous discovery as this as making our research activities teeny tiny so that we literally can do them every week. Um, I'll give a really clear example of this. If you look at um, sort of user research, um, project-based user research, a team would typically interview half a dozen to a dozen customers they take all their insights, maybe do an affinity mapping exercise, create a research report of all their findings, and then socialize it around the company or across the product teams. Um, that's There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, we have many longer horizon questions that need project-based research. But a product team is trying to ship value every week. And so we have teeny tiny questions that we're making every week that could benefit from customer input. And so we obviously can't interview six to 12 customers every week. That's just not sustainable. What we can do is we can have a customer conversation, a 20 minute conversation every week. And then what that does is instead of doing a whole bunch of interviews, we're continuously interviewing. We're continu Instead of doing this nice shiny research deck, we're continuously synthesizing what we're learning. And we're just always investing in our knowledge about our customer. It's a little bit like putting money in the bank, right? It's just gonna compound over time. Um, and the, 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 the like argument I make for this is that product teams, if you're good, you're obsessing about your product. You know your product inside and out, you know how it works, you know the underlying data model, you know where everything is in the interface. And we suffer from a bias called the curse of knowledge, where we forget what it's like to not have all that knowledge. And the problem with this is our customers don't have any of, most of that knowledge. So then we design things that they can't use because they don't have the same knowledge that we have. So if you adopt this continuous cadence of just engaging with your customers every week, every week you're getting an opportunity to realize the gap between how you think about things and how your customers think about things. And if you realize that gap, you're then much more likely to work to close it. I love that. It's a, it's a good explanation. And I, uh, I stumbled upon your opportunity solution tree, which you have on your website. And I was relating to it quite heavily. And I, I wanted to ask you a question there around the recommendation approach there, around how product teams should develop at least three solutions for yeah. each opportunity. What what is your logic around that? Yeah. So um, so first, some for some context, an opportunity solution tree is just a visual that helps you map out the best path to your desired outcome. So you start with this open ended challenge like move this metric, and it helps you map out what are the customer needs that if you could address to move the metric. And then ultimately, when you choose the target opportunity, what are the solutions that would best address that target opportunity? Pervasive throughout the whole model is this idea of comparing contrast decisions. And this comes from decision-making research. So what we tend to do on product teams is we hear about a problem, we come up with a solution to solve it, and we start testing that solution if we're, if we're discovery-minded, right? But we find ourselves in all, these, in all this trouble when we do that. So the first is maybe we prototype it and we get some qualitative feedback. Now we're stuck with, is that feedback good enough or not? That's a really hard question to answer, right? It's not that there's a good idea and a bad idea. It's that ideas are better or worse. And it's really hard to say that feedback was good enough, let's ship it. Um, even when we quantitatively test, let's say you get a conversion rate number, you're still not sure. Like I get asked on Twitter all the time, hey, my conversion rate is 12%, is that good? I have no idea. Right, And so when we work with one idea at a time, we're making it impossible to make judgments on our discovery activities. The other problem with one idea at a time is that it, call, it brings into play two biases. 
The first is called escalation of commitment, which basically says the more we invest in something, the more we identify with it. The more we identify it with it, we're, what that means in a product world is that we start to fall in love with our ideas, which then exacerbates okay. the, the second bias, which is confirmation bias. So confirmation bias says um, we're much more likely to see the evidence that suggests our idea is going to work and less likely to see the evidence that it might be flawed, right? And so when we're working with one idea at a time, we're going to, even if we're experimenting and doing all the right things, we're not going to know how to evaluate the results. We're going to miss almost all of the negative feedback. So if you work with a set of solutions and you're, and you're experimenting and collecting data on all three, you can compare and contrast. And this compare and contrast helps to overcome escalation of commitment because you're working on multiple ideas at once. It also helps to overcome confirmation bias because in a, com in a comparison, we're much more likely to see the pros and cons of each idea. Uh, that's an awesome explanation. I hope that everybody who's going to be listening can really appreciate the value of what you just said, because it's so fundamentally true. We, we deal with it a lot. And, uh, you know, a lot of those biases you mentioned are things that always happen in with, with a lot of our client engagements. So, um, we'll post a link to, um, that tree in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in the video comments area or the description because I think it's really valuable for people to identify with that a bit better. Um, I wanted to ask about getting buy-in. <clears throat> Even for us, when it comes to convincing a client the importance of doing discovery, it's always like, well, like I already know what I want. Like I, you know, I, you know, I don't need to do discovery. You must get asked this question like all the time, you know, uh, they, they probably say things like, yeah, we know how important, you know, these things are, but like, how can I get, you know, the rest of my stakeholders potentially in the company who are going to be writing the checks or, you know, you know, seeing the ROI on something like this um, pan out. So I want to ask you, what is your secret sauce or what is your formula to getting uh, to convincing product leaders uh, who face this always um, question that comes up by, by their management or the leadership teams in terms of the value of getting, uh, doing this and doing it properly. Yeah. So I'll tackle this from both the sort of individual product team side and the product leader side. So that if you're an individual contributor, a product manager, a designer, an engineer, you're working on a product team and you're trying to get buy-in from your boss or from other stakeholders to, to get, to get to do discovery. I would say don't fight the ideological battle, just do the work. And that sounds crazy, but here's the thing. You can make friends with somebody on the sales team to get access to customers. You can talk to an account manager and join some of their meetings. Like everybody, regardless of your company culture, can find an easy in to some customer exposure. So start small. And then as you build relationships and you show results, iterate from there. And the reason why I suggest you not fight the ideological war is because you're going to lose. Like that's just the hard reality. Like you're you're arguing with your bosses. Your bosses are in the position they were because what they've done in the past um, worked for them and got them there. And the best way to influence somebody is to show results and have them be curious about how you're working. So if you're on, if you're an individual contributor, focus on how you do your own work and try to adopt some of these practices and bring them into your own practice. And I'll say even if you're being asked to deliver a fixed roadmap. If you individually develop an outcome mindset and get more exposure to your customers and start to map out the opportunity space, even if you have zero latitude in what, what you're building, you'll make better versions of those outputs with that bigger context. So that's what I would say on the individual contributor side is just um, focus on yourself and how your own team is working. It's kind of like the analogy of like you get uh, make, make lemonade with whatever yeah. you can kind of thing, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah, and here's the thing, you're gonna be amazed at how much you can do on your own. Like uh, one of the biggest barriers are people are just waiting for permission. Don't wait for permission, go make it happen. You have way more agency than you think. On the product leadership side, so now we're talking about chief product officer, VP of product, like an executive who has the ability to influence the direction of an organization. I think the, the way to motivate your teams and your peers, so your sort of C-level executive peers, is to start, start to show the gap between what you think is working and what's actually happening. 
So we all think we're making good discovery decisions. We all think everything we ship is amazing. We think we're serving customers and nothing is gonna change as long as that's the um, predominant belief. So I think the first step is to say, let's start to put um, instrument our products. Let's start collecting some good analytics. Let's start interviewing our customers. Let's put a face to what's in a, a, um, quotes and visuals and audio and video of what's actually happening. So we can start to see that, hey, we're not always right. And then that's going to open the door to having a conversation about how can we increase our hit rate. And one thing I, I, I came across was you, you get um, what you recommend to the product leaders that um, you work with in terms of what questions to ask during product retrospectives. And I think one of them was, could we have learned you know, whatever was sooner than, yeah. than uh, when we just realized it now. Do you have any kind of valuable questions or other kind of tidbits, question, you know, uh, ideas uh, or frameworks that you could maybe um, add on to that that uh, can help stakeholders really understand the value of, the, of constantly talking to customers and doing these smaller research activities instead of just building features? Yeah, so I think there's two parts to this. So the question that you referred to, it's part, it's what I recommend as part of like a sprint retrospective for the team, the product team themselves. So that cross-functional sort of squad where ever, if you do Scrum, you can do it in your Scrum retrospective. If you don't do Scrum, just do it every week or two where you just look back and say, what did we learn in the last week or two that surprised us, right? This could be anything. It could be an insight from an interview. It could be a solution that didn't quite meet your expectations. It could be something was harder to build than you thought it would be. And then for each of the things that you generate, ask a follow-up question, which is how could we have learned that sooner? Mm -hmm. Because usually what's happening is we have an assumption that we didn't surface and test in our discovery. And so going through that process will help you see your own blind spots and help. It's a really good feedback loop for improving your own discovery practices. For, for product leaders, I think what they need are questions. Here's what product leaders struggle with. If I'm a head of product, I'm probably responsible for outcomes myself. And then I'm turning around and pushing those down to my teams. And I might totally believe in the empowered team model and want to give them the autonomy to do their own work. But if it looks like they're not making enough progress, I start to feel the heat of, oh, I'm not going to hit my own outcome. And so what do leaders do in those instances is they tend to fall back to what we all grew up with, which is command and control, uh, micromanaging, let's get back to outputs. And we forget everything we truly believe in and want to do around empowered teams. So what leaders need are questions to ask in those moments. And I think the key is this is where a coaching mindset is really critical. So what does a coach do? A coach asks powerful questions. So instead of jumping in and saying, hey, I, don't th I think you're building the wrong thing, build this instead, come in and get curious about how did you make that decision? What data did you base it on? Are you engaging with customers? Um, are you understanding the context of our customers? Do you have a good understanding of the strategic context for the company? And by exploring those questions as a leader, you can start to look at if they're not making, not necessarily the same decisions that you would have, but decisions that aren't going to work in your organizational context, you can start to uncover what's the knowledge gap that the team has. And instead of dictating outputs, you can help them fill that knowledge gap. So that could be anything from they misunderstand the company strategy or they're just not spending enough time with their customers. Um, I want to ask in terms of uh, getting some examples of some of the situations. So one example could be something that you came across recently or in the past that you could maybe share in terms of you getting pushback on trying to implement continuous discovery and how you dealt with it. Or on the flip side, if you know of a product leader who uh, successfully kind of implemented continuous discovery uh, into their into their organization, despite getting a lot of pushback initially, and what do they do in order to circumvent that? Yeah, so um, this is where like having a uh, like understanding how change occurs in an organization can be really helpful. So uh, one mistake that a lot of leaders make is they try to do a wholesale change all at once, and teams are really resistant to this because we get a little bit of the flavor of the week. Like I get it. You read this cool book or article and now you want to try this, but next month it'll be a different flavor. And so I don't really have to buy in. I don't really have to commit because it's all going to change, right? 
I think a much better strategy for change is to start really small. And when it comes to discovery, I think the, the best place to start is how do you just increase the frequency at which your teams are engaging with customers? And so as a leader, there's a lot of things I can do there. I can start to look at how do I reduce the barriers to getting in front of a customer? Um, do I have sales teams that are, are preventing our product teams from getting in front of customers? If I'm a large, if I have a large product team, I want to think about um, can I maybe have somebody recruiting for all my product teams so that I can alleviate that burden? I might need to be thinking about how do I make sure not everybody's talking to the same customer um, and hounding the same customer over and over again. So the product leader can really look at if you have behaviors that you know you want people to do instead of just saying do these behaviors because that's not likely to be successful work with your teams to understand what are the barriers to doing those behaviors and then think about it as a design problem how do you remove those barriers in the context of your organization um, and i would really look at one change at a time so i would focus on first getting regular access to customers after that i would probably focus on compare and contrast decisions after that i would probably look at how do we surface and test assumptions? Mm -hmm. And um, when it comes to recruiting recruiting candidates um, for uh, you know these type of product discovery experiments uh, as a product leader, what would you uh, what would you recommend or what tactics would you present to to them who would be going and sourcing these type of candidates? Um, or maybe existing customers or whoever they are, so that uh, they could uh, continuously have like a funnel of people to constantly speak to? Yeah, so the biggest hurdle to this cadence of continuous interviewing where we're interviewing someone every, every week really is it's hard to find people to talk to. So what I recommend is that teams actually automate the recruiting process. It sounds magical. What it means is that you show up to work on Monday morning, you look at your calendar and there's already an interview there, which is pretty amazing, right? Now doing an interview is no different than going to any other meeting on your calendar. So how do we get there? Um, there's a million ways to do this. The three most common are to recruit people while they're using your product. So somewhere within the product, you can pop up an interstitial or have some call out that says that offers some reward in exchange for a small amount of time. You can combine that with scheduling software where they just click on a link and book on your calendar directly. You literally have to do nothing other than maybe turn that recruiting interstitial on or off. Um, that's by far the most common way. Uh, for products or services, if you're a brand new product and you don't have any customers yet, you can still use that strategy. You just need to do it on a landing page where you're driving ads to that page. Um, a lot of startups do that as demand testing. It's very effective. For some companies, like typically enterprise co companies, if you are trying to interview people that are different from who's in your product all day, every day. So if you're B2B and your end users are in your product, recruit them while they're using your product. But if you need to talk to the buyer, for example, and they're not in your product, that's where you can use your customer um, facing teams that already work at your company to help you recruit. So that could be sales teams, uh, customer success teams, support teams, account managers. Somebody in your building is talking to customers every day. So you can define triggers for them. Basically say, if you talk to a customer who has this need, um, ask them if they'll spend time with our product team. Um, and then it, I have worked with some companies where they either work with their customers are either really high value individual, like where their time is really valuable. So like CEOs or investment bankers, or they work in teeny tiny markets. Like I worked with a company, there's six customers in their total addressable market because their customers are US movie studios, right? So in those instances where either your the time of your customer is extremely valuable, and I can't emphasize this enough, I mean on the extreme end, like everybody thinks their customer's time is valuable, but I'm talking about like CEOs, investor, investment bankers who want to be secretive about the way they work, politicians, not your run-of-the-mill everyday people, sports athletes, professional athletes, right? Um, or teeny tiny markets. What you want to do is build long-term relationships with a subset of your customers so you can go back to the same people over and over again. Uh, I, so I'm really curious on this product. Uh, it must must be so hard to get um, the head of a studio's attention. <laughs> um, but uh, I want to ask, do you find there's any difference between uh, recruiting customers and speaking to them between a B2B versus a B2C approach um, um, when it comes to kind of like interviewing them? Um, 
you know, or having them participate in, uh, in these workshops or in these user testing interviews? Yeah, I would say the tactics are really similar. The key difference is that in a B2B context, you might have more, I mean, even in the B2C context, you might have different users, but in the B2B context, oftentimes the buyer is different from the user. And we rarely see that in the B2C context. Um, so the complexity of the people, that the types of users you need to interview um, and and maybe there's fewer overlapping needs across those. Like usually in a B2B context, the buyer is really concerned about things like scalability and security and how they pay and how they monitor behavior in the product. And the um, end user in that product could care less about any of those things. So we see little overlap between needs. Um, but other than that, I think that the recruiting tactics, the how you would interview them, what you're trying to learn from them are all really similar. And um, what's your what's your perspective? Because we've been <clears throat> trying different things in the past, and um, I, I'd love to know how do you go about incentivizing people to participate and give their time towards uh, doing these product discoveries or these um, interviews with with the, with, the, with the team that's asking for their time? You know, monetary, non-monetary. What's your perspective on all this? Yeah. So first of all, uh, teams have a hard time recruiting. Because most people are going to say no to something that they don't understand what's going to happen. So if you send an email to someone and you say, hey, will you participate in my research study for an hour? I'm going to say no, because I have no idea what I'm going to be doing for that hour. Most humans fear the unknown, and it's just not that compelling. In fact, I'm part of a number of product Slack communities where people post all the time, like, will you please fill out my one-minute survey? Why? What's in it for me? Like, why would I do that? Right? And I'm a discovery coach. Like I get you're trying to do discovery, but you're not, you're not asking in a way where it's easy for somebody to say yes. And this is the key principle. When you're recruiting participants, you need to make it dead simple for them to say yes. So there's a lot of elements that go into that. You need to ask for a teeny tiny amount of time. I would never do an hour long interview. At most, I would do 30 minutes. If my participants are really busy, I would ask for five minutes, right? I want to make it as dead simple um, to get on their calendar. Uh, I would want to make, if I'm using scheduling software, I want to give them as many scheduling options as possible and make it as easy as possible for them to find a time that works for them. I'm going to try to schedule the interview as close to the time that I asked them as possible. So I'm not going to schedule the interview for three weeks out because humans are optimistic about how much time they'll have in the future. And we never have as much time as we think. So what's going to happen three weeks from now is that person's going to be busy and they're going to cancel if they're nice, and they're going to no-show if they're not. Um, so try to schedule it as close to when you're booking it as possible. Um, and then as far as incentives, so if you do a good job of explaining what you hope to get out of the interview, and you interview, you keep your interview focused on the participant and not on your product, um, oftentimes you don't need to offer an incentive at all because you've removed the unknowns, You've made it clear that you want to learn about them and you want to help them. And if they value your product, if it plays an important role in their life, they want to have that conversation. Um, sometimes we do need to incentivize them just to, until they get comfortable with what does this look like? What in the world are we doing? And that's where you want to think about um, a small ask in exchange for a big reward. And the big reward doesn't have to be money. In fact, in a B2B context, money is rarely going to work. Um, it just needs to be something that's valuable for the customer that's fairly inexpensive for your company to offer. Um, and I can give some examples. Uh, I worked with a company that was in the um, like real estate listings space and they their uh, customers were first time home buyers. They offered um, an ex access to an exclusive webinar that went over the whole process of how to buy your first home in exchange for an interview. That's really, if you've never bought a home and you don't know how to get a mortgage and you don't know how the whole process works, that's really valuable, right? Um, other people do discounts on services, access to premium helplines, white papers that include insightful research. Um, there's a million things you can do here. It'll take experimentation, right? You got to find that right balance. And uh, any, any advice to give to people who are like pre-product, pre-revenue, have an idea and they want to go and uh, do some product discovery with uh, the target audience. Yeah, so go to where your customers hang out. So one of the easiest things you can do is um, launch a landing page. You don't have to know what your product is gonna be. The landing page literally could be about your problem space, 
we want to help new moms do A, B, and C, right? I don't know how we're going to do that, but that's, what, that's our goal. That's what we want to try to do. Um, drive ads to that page, recruit people from that page. Um, that's one of the easiest things to do. You could get something like that live in just a couple of hours. Um, you also can go to where they are already hanging out. So that whether, depending on your audience, that could be Facebook groups, LinkedIn groups, forums. It could be in person. I've had teams that were working with um, their audience for people that were trying to buy a new car and they literally hung out at car dealerships. Um, and especially right now, like everybody on the planet is trying to buy a new car in the U.S. And so if you hang out at a car dealership, there's a lot of waiting around, right? Plenty of time to go interview someone while they're waiting around. Um, so I think the key is to just make it, again, you're trying to make it as easy as possible on your on the people you're trying to talk to. So go to them. And that can be go to them digitally. It doesn't have to be go to them physically. I love that. That's great. Uh, it, the one the part about you saying about... Um... Uh, people going to car dealerships because everybody's buying a car. I mean, yeah, you're right. Just go to where you think people are going to hang out and you'd be surprised who you can come across and how much time they would give you if they're already there. Um, the next question I want to ask you, Teresa, is regards to um, user research and how to, how to get it effectively. Um, from my experience, and I know from the experience of other product leaders, um, Sometimes you have that tendency to only really hear what you want to hear, right? You know, it could be that innovator's dilemma. It could be whatever kind of like tunnel vision you have. Um, and we only want to make what, what we want. And, you know, we make assumptions about, you know, a lot of the things, uh, uh, you know, outside of that. What advice would you give to product leaders who are looking to become less speculative in their research? Yeah, yeah. Um... Here's the reality as an industry, we're not that good at research methods yet. We're getting better, but we're not that good at yet, right? So we say, go talk to customers. Okay, you could have a hundred customer conversations and not glean a, a single reliable insight because you're asking the wrong questions. So I think the key is to do a little bit of work in terms of getting good at honing your research craft. And there's lots of ways to do this. There's plenty of free articles online. There's online courses. Um, I offer some, I know plenty of other people offer some, there's plenty of books. Um, so depending on your learning style, I would find the right way of learning for you and make sure you invest a little bit into this craft. I meet people that have been interviewing for 10 years and they're still asking all the wrong questions. Um, and it's a lot of it is because we just don't, like in, in industry, we don't have this understanding of what it takes to do um, reliable and valid research. And of course we don't, we're not academic researchers. Um, but we can, and we can't do, nor can we do academic research because academic research is long and slow and takes decades to learn anything, right? And we're working on a much faster timeline, but we can borrow from their methods and from their techniques and then adopt them for our faster cadence. And so the key when in interviewing is you need to avoid speculative questions and stay grounded in actual customer behavior. Um, I teach this in my continuous interviewing class. I also cover it in my book, just how do you shift to keeping more of your interview grounded in sp stories about specific instances. When you're assumption testing, it's really about um, how do you surface assumptions and align as a, around a team before you run experiments so that you're not influenced by the data. Um, confirmation bias comes into play when we're talking about assumption testing. And so there's just really easy tactics you can adopt to kind of counteract a lot of our biases. The key is you have to know that the biases are real and then learn the methods to overcome them. And how do you um, how do you ensure that the insights that you collect uh, from from your customers are you know well organized, well structured, and actually can give you the right insights that uh, you want to have to make decisions on? Yeah, so this is a lot of what the opportunity solution tree is designed to help with. So if I'm on a product team and I'm doing a customer interview. There's sort of two levels, two to three levels of synthesis, depending on how you think about it. The first is, how do I capture everything I learned in this particular interview? So if I think about it as an interview by interview synthesis, it's just, what did I hear from this person? What was their story? How do I capture that? Um, in the book, I introduced a template for that. It's called an interview snapshot. It just helps you quickly capture um, what you're learning so that it's actionable. What are the opportunities that I heard? What was this customer's experience map? Those are the two primary components. Now, when you're synthesizing across interviews, I like to see teams do that at two different levels. One is, 
how, how do you identify and evolve an experience map that represents all of your customers? So it's sort of this super experience map. And then the second is the opportunity solution tree, which is your interview snapshots and your um, experience map are outcome independent. Whereas your um, opportunity solution tree are saying, we're trying to reach this outcome. What are the opportunities that we're hearing that can help us get there? And then the tree structure in particular, using the tree structure to map out the opportunity space, helps us deconstruct big, hard problems that might take years to solve um, into smaller, more iterative uh, opportunities that we can go after and start to ship value continuously. I'm really curious. You, you built all this knowledge up over the years. Uh, you know, um, where did you learn all this from? And uh, I know you have your book and you have your your own courses and things like that. But what what places would you recommend uh, listeners to go to uh, to learn about all these skills from interviewing to analyzing the data and the insights? Uh, any 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 ones that come to mind, like you know, top five recommended places to go and study from? Yeah, well, so I will share I do have my new book, Continuous Discovery Habits Out, which my goal was to give you everything. Like, in fact, one of the reviews, they said most books are an advertisement for a workshop. Teresa's book feels like the workshop. And that made me very happy because my goal is to give you everything and it's in the book. Um, I also have um, a ton of free material on producttalk.org and we have the Product Talk Academy um, at learn.producttalk.org with courses. So my goal is I'm trying to help people adopt this. What are the resources that I drew inspiration from? Um, I really geek out on problem solving research, decision making research and critical thinking research. So I often refer to Decisive by Chip and Dan Heath which is a book that just does a phenomenal job of summarizing what do we know about decision-making research. Um, on the critical thinking front, uh, my go-to on that is How We Think by John Dewey, although I will say it's a very hard read, uh, but it's just full of gold nuggets. Um, on the problem-solving side, I don't have a really great book to recommend on this. Um, I have a number of researchers, David Jonasson is one, who's just done some phenomenal work in this space that just helps us start to think about how do we how do we like develop our problem solving skills? So I personally tend to draw a lot from academic research, and then I've been really be, um, blessed in that I've had a chance to work with a lot of product teams. So then I can kind of test those ideas that come from research in a lot of different contexts and really get a sense for how do we make this actionable and really pragmatic for product teams and the context in which they're working. And uh, would you say that there's a difference in terms of how you approach um, research, whether based on what stage of a company you're at, whether you're early on, you're at launch, or you're like a mature company, and any kind of main differences, or would you say it's kind of very similar regardless what stage you're in? Yeah, so I think um, across stage of companies, there's a lot of similarities with one exception. If you're a startup and you don't have a product at all you, and you haven't identified a customer segment and a value proposition, or if you're in an enterprise and you're launching a new product and you haven't identified that yet, I actually would start with a business model canvas and, and nail down um, your theory about who your customer segment is and what value proposition you're gonna deliver with them. Once you have those two pieces of the business model canvas in place, then you're probably ready to set an outcome and start adopting some of these dis discovery activities. Mm -hmm. um, and sorry, I'm, I'm going to a previous thought I, I wanted to ask you. Sure. As a product manager, so, so not a product leader, somebody, a product manager within a pod stru structure in, in, the, in, in a team, how much time would you say that they should, that they should focus on between discovery versus delivery on a weekly basis? Yeah, this is a hard question. So I have seen numbers. I don't, they might've come from Marty Kagan. I'm not positive about that. I know somebody, maybe Mar Marty, said that product managers should spend 80% of their time in discovery and 20% in delivery. And that engineers, your lead engineer and your lead designer should be 50-50. Roughly, I would say that's right. But here's what I don't like about putting numbers on this. First of all, there's not a clear boundary between discovery and delivery. We do learn in our delivery work what, that feeds back into discovery. So it's not, it's never gonna be that clean. And I can't tell a product manager like spend six hours a day on discovery and two hours a day on delivery 
because there's going to be weeks where delivery is a crisis and you're going to have to spend more time on that. Um, I think when you get good at continuous discovery, it becomes the way you do your job. And so then this question of like, how much time do I spend in discovery? It's like my brain breaks on it a little bit. Like, I don't know how to even think about how to answer that question. Um, it's a mindset shift more than it's an activity shift because the activities that you do can still be teeny tiny. So they don't have to take a lot of time. But if you don't make the mindset shift, you could do all the right activities and not see any benefit from them. So I don't, I do think that like the trio driving discovery should be spending a good amount of their time in discovery, but I don't, they're just going to do that naturally when it becomes the way that they work. Like it's just, it's all going to feel like work. And what, what would you recommend to people who aren't, um, who started doing continuous discovery, right? They've overcome, overcome and committed to, you know, uh, to doing it. Um, what if they're not, what if they start getting discouraged or they're not seeing the results that they're hoping to do and they start losing drive or commitment towards seeing this through on a long-term basis because they're not getting the results short-term? Yeah, so it's going to take time. That's the first thing, right? So if you're working on an outcome and you've never tried to move that metric, the reality is unless you get really lucky, you're not going to move that metric in the short run it's going to take some cycles of experimenting and learning, right? And so we can't always measure our success by did we hit our goal or not. We have to also consider, did we try enough things that in our next round, we feel like we're going to get better than we did in our last round. And so I think this continuous improvement mindset is really critical to apply even to the way that we work because you're going to strike out a lot. But the way to think about it is what you used to do when you struck out was you just didn't know it. So you still built that product and you shipped it and you wasted a ton of time, right? So if we think about our discovery failures as we just saved ourselves a ton of time and money from building the wrong thing, we still don't know what to build yet and that feels really uncomfortable, right? But at least we're not wasting time building the wrong thing. And if you're doing your discovery well, with each cycle, you should get closer and closer to finding the right thing. If you're not, you need to take time in your retrospective to look at where might, where might we be going off the off the path? Mm -hmm. A couple more questions for you, Teresa. Um, I want to ask about the type of people who should be doing discovery. Because uh, in certain organizations, uh, I've seen in some of the enterprises that we work with, a lot of BAs do this mm -hmm. type of work um, instead of like the product managers or, or somebody else on the product team. So I know you're a big advocate that, you know, research, research should be done by the product, by the team building the product, right? Mm -hmm. Who would you say, like, who, who would be that, that core team that, you know, has to participate, whether it's a startup or an enterprise? Yeah, so when I say by the team building the product, here's the goal. We want to avoid handoffs. If I do a bunch of research and then I say, hey, here you go, go build this, what's going to happen is, you're going to have your own opinions about what we should be building. You're going to mistrust my research. You're not going to have all of the context. You're going to make little decisions that deviate from what's actually going to work because you don't have firsthand exposure to the customer. So it's actually really important that whoever is building the product is a part of the discovery work. In most organizations, um, the minimum that should be driving discovery should be a product manager, a designer, and an engineer. Now, I will say in the last few weeks since the book has been out, the number one question and or feedback I get comes in the form of, I'm all up in arms. I can't believe you didn't include this role in your trio. And the roles have been anything from BAs to content marketers, to mar product marketing managers, to data analysts, to UX writers, to like name your favorite role. Um, what drives me nuts about this is literally anytime I've talked about the product trio, including in the book, I talk about the key principle of the product trio is how do you get the right cross-functional roles in the room for the decision that you're trying to make? And the idea of the trio can flex based on what your organizational higher, um, roles look like. So if you have the luxury of having a UX writer, which I literally have never worked anywhere that had a UX writer, but if you have that luxury and you really feel like they need to be a part of every single decision, include them in your trio, right? Like it's not, it's not, a, it's not rocket science. It really is about, we wanna make sure that the right roles are represented given the type of decision that we wanna make. 
We don't want to overcorrect and include everybody in every decision because we literally will never get anything done. That, that's so true. Just figure out who has to be involved in the product team and then get their commitments. I've never heard of a, a UX, what was that? A UX writer? A UX writer. That's Somebody's fair. writing UX copy. Like I get why that's a thing. Yeah. Okay. But, but, here, but here's the thing. Like I defined the trio to represent what I see at the vast majority of companies. We're getting to the point where the vast majority of companies have product managers, designers, and engineers. And yeah, some of them call them product owners instead of product managers, or some of them use BAs instead of product managers, or some of them have product designers and was it Square that had product editors? Like, I get it. Everybody has like their different flavor of titles. The core principle is who are the people that need to be involved in the decision? Okay. Um, I'm gonna put out a rant about that eventually. Oh yeah. Okay, cool. I'm going to look forward to that. Um, a couple last questions. Um, what, what software tools can you not live without when, when doing continuous discovery? Oh, this is a good question. So I try really hard to not take a stance on particular tools because I think it's really important that every team find the tools that work for them, but I will share the types of tools that I think are really critical. So the first is uh, some type of virtual whiteboard. So the two big ones right now are Miro and Mural. I know some people still use Jamboard. That's cool. Whatever works for your team, you probably need some sort of collaborative visual space where you can create experience maps and opportunity solution trees and story maps and whatnot. Um, the second one I would say is, I mean, almost every team has like a, a place where they're tracking work in progress. So that could be something like Trello or Atlassian's product or whatever. Um, that it's just sort of helping your team coordinate who's doing what. And I think that's equally important in discovery as it is in delivery. Uh, we do, I think we're living in like the heyday of discovery tools. So there's a couple other tools I would recommend. One is um, an unmoderated testing tool. So uh, if you're not familiar with unmoderated testing, uh, it's sort of like usability testing, although you can use it for much more than just usability testing. You upload an image or a prototype uh, they recruit, or you can actually use your own participants on a number of the tools and they just run through it on their own. So you don't have to moderate each, each session and you get a video. And so what's great about this is you can create a prototype, post it on one of these tools the next day, get 10 responses. You didn't have to recruit, you didn't have to schedule and you didn't have to actually conduct them and be exhausted at the end of the day. So I think every team should look into access to an unmoderated tool unmoderated testing tool. And then the second one is what I refer to as a one question survey tool, but there's lots of different types of tools that will unlock this. So a one question survey tool is where you can just somehow in your product pop up a single question um, and just collect fast answers. So some teams do this with tools like Qualaroo and Ethneo, which I think were originally designed for this, but you can do it with Intercom. You can do it with Usabilla. I think you can do it with user Zoom. There's a million ways to do this. Um, but it can be really helpful when you get into testing specific assumptions to be able to just collect a hundred responses to a one question survey in an hour or two. Yeah, I think the, um, even Hotjar has this functionality now as yep. well. Yep. And with the unmoderated uh, uh, platforms, we use uh, usertesting.com and usabilityhub.com. They're really great. Um, have, have you used those tools before? Did, did you like them or? Uh, I've used user testing. I think they really innovated in the unmoderated testing space. I know they have competitors. Again, I try really hard to stay out of the tool battle because I don't okay. want somebody to think <laughs> I'm endorsing one tool over another. Yeah. Um, I've played with Hotjar a little bit, but it's been years. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, last question for you. Um, uh, this is, I think, really hard to, for some people to answer around like, uh, why build product or, you know, the traditional way of what to look for when, uh, when we're creating one. But I want to ask, you know, uh, around the concept of desirability, feasibility of anything that you do, it's always, you always try to kind of fit something in the middle that, you know, w would work. Uh, are there other categories companies should be looking at before they build anything? Um, other than desirability, feasibility? Yeah, so the, the three common ones that you'll often see in that Venn diagram that I think was, um, I tried to track down the source of this for my book, 
Um, some people attribute it to IDO, but I think maybe Tony Olwick of the Jobs to be Done sort of um, realm may, may have introduced it even earlier, but I could not fully track that down. Um, but the three most common categories are viability, desirability, and feasibility. So desirability, does anybody want it? Feasibility, can we do it? Is it possible? Viability, is it good for our business? Can we get a return on our investment? Um, I would add usability. We're pretty good at usability, so that's not a surprise for most people. And then the fifth category that I add, which we're terrible at as an industry, is ethical assumptions. So um, we should be building desirable, viable, feasible, usable, and ethical products. Um, and that ethical category, I think about it in two ways. One is it's really easy to overlook the data decisions that we're making, what data we're collecting, how we're using it, who we're selling it to. Do our customers understand that? Are they comfortable with it? Would they agree to it if it was written in black and white terms for them? Um, but I think there's also other ethical assumptions like who are we choosing to serve? Who are we leaving out? Um, who are we testing with? Are we releasing something because it really works for the majority of people, but uh, there's a, a minority that's being underrepresented or it just doesn't work for? Um, and we have a lot of really unfortunate examples of products that worked for a majority and, and catastrophically failed for a minority. Uh, and I think we have a long way to go in terms of getting better at that as an industry. I, I love that. I, I, I've I've never heard anybody say that, but I think you're totally accurate on on that fifth one. So thank you so much, uh, Teresa, for yep. sharing all this awesome information with us today. I uh, it's an overwhelming amount of knowledge for anybody who's going to be uh, listening to this. But great, great uh, suggestions, and I think your know how really is at a different level. So. Thanks again. Uh, and for everybody listening, I hope you enjoy this episode and stay tuned for, for next time. Thanks again, Teresa. Awesome. Thanks for having me. It was fun. 